So we have a new presidential candidate who just jumped into the race. His name is Vivek Ramaswamy. He's going to run as a Republican. He's called the CEO of Anti-Woke Incorporated. Um, I wanted to dive into his release video here, his policy platform, and um, we'll break it down as we go. I remember in 1993 when I was in second grade and I heard Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech for the first time. That was the speech where he said, I hope my four children grow up in a country where they are judged not on the color of their skin, but on the content of their character. That dream stuck with me. It meant something to me. I grew up in Ohio in the 90s as a skinny kid with nerdy glasses and a funny last name. My parents taught me that if you're going to stand out, then you might as well be outstanding. Achievement was my ticket to get ahead. I went on to found multi-billion dollar companies, and I did it while getting married, raising a family, and following my faith in God. Let me pause just to say, for a guy who has never been involved in politics, he is the most politician-y politician I've ever seen in my life. I mean, Jesus Christ. He sounds like he's a robot. He sounds like he's programmed to be an insider status quo sounding politician. And I always, oh my God, these videos are hilarious when they do the whole family thing where it's like, you know, look, we're, we're, we're reading the book to the child. Aren't we good parents? And then the second they're off, they're like, Ugh, get away from me. Where's the help? And yes, I am a millennial. I was born in 1985. But the sad part is that if I'd been born 20 years later, I think my story would have been impossible. We're in the middle of a national identity crisis today. Our nation is hungry for a cause, for purpose, for meaning. The things that used to fill that void, like faith, patriotism, hard work, and family, have disappeared. We now embrace one secular religion after another, from COVIDism to climatism and gender ideology. COVIDism to climateism to gender ideology. Yeah, yeah, you're really hitting the major flaws in the country, man. COVIDism, by the way, if you look at polls now, where does COVID rank among the concerns of the American people? I'm not kidding. And the most recent poll I've seen, it's literally the bottom issue. It's the dead bottom issue. Climatism, you're acting, what? There's no fundamentalist religion around climate science. It's just people saying, it seems like we should maybe get off fossil fuels. It might be better for the future if we don't absolutely destroy the planet by using fossil fuels until the end of time. And again, gender ideology. Republicans ran in the midterms. This is one of the main things they ran on. It's like, oh my God, the Democrats want to force your kid to transition. It's a total lie, but they ran on it. And how'd they do? The Republicans did a historic underperformance in the midterm elections. Why? Because they leaned into a lot of culture war garbage like this, along with the fake, you know, rigged election stuff. So, like, what? This guy is so deep in his bubble. It's hilarious watching him try to marry together, like, standard politician speak and, like, trying to sound like, I have a vision for the future. The Martin Luther King quote is. And then he goes from that to, like, climate change is fake, <laughs> COVIDism is a religion, and gender ideology is a religion. Oh, geez. Oddly enough, these guys have more of a religion in their, like, stance against all that stuff, right? Like, this, these are some of the first issues he brought up. These issues. To satisfy our deeper need for identity. Yet we cannot even answer the question of what it means to be an American in the year 2023. Today, the woke left preys on that vacuum. They tell you that you're race. So we got a, a woke reference at about a minute and 30 seconds in. The CEO of Anti-Woke Incorporated brought up woke at, uh, you know, a minute and 30 seconds in. Weird. He brings up wokeness and COVIDism and gender ideology and climatism before he brings up wages or health care or income and wealth inequality or corruption. Your gender and your sexual orientation govern who you are and what you can achieve in life. If you question that orthodoxy, they call you a bigot, a homophobe a climate denier, a racist. And there is no greater damnation in modern America than to be called a racist. This is psychological slavery. Yep. And that's created a new culture of fear in our country that has completely replaced our culture of free speech in America. If you ask me, the best measure of the health of American democracy is actually the percentage of people who feel free to say what they actually think in public. And right now we're doing abysmally. That's why today I'm announcing my run for president of the United States. 
This isn't just a political campaign. This is a cultural movement to create a new dream for the next generation of Americans. And this time around, it isn't just about money. Okay, all right, dude. You can't say it's a movement before it's an actual movement. You can't say that. You can't do that. That doesn't make any sense. This isn't just a campaign. It's a movement. Movement? Bro, you probably got like seven people on your staff and a whopping 12 supporters outside of that, and most of them you're related to. What are you talking about movement? Movement my ass cheeks. Movement? You got a movement? Ain't no movement. People right now are going, who? Who's running? What's his name? I've never heard of him. What's going on here? It's about the unapologetic pursuit of excellence in our country. It means you believe in merit, that you get ahead in this country, not on the color of your skin, but on the content of your character and your contributions. We've never had a meritocracy in this country, ever. We have never, ever, for even a split second in America, had a meritocracy. The idea that the harder you work, the further you go, that is a meritocracy. We've never had that, ever. So it drives me crazy when these people, we need to get back to a meritocracy, get back to a meritocracy. When was there a meritocracy? Please tell me the years. Didn't exist. Never existed. We live much, we are much closer to like an anti-meritocracy than a meritocracy. Look at a lot of the people who make it to the top. They're the most shameless and ruthless in the business world. In politics, look at George Santos, a, a, a pathological liar that's so pathological he makes other liars look like truth tellers. He made it to Congress. We don't have, some of the hardest working people I know live in poverty. We just covered a story the other day. You need to work four full-time jobs at minimum wage to be able to live. And he's about, we got to get back to a meritocracy. Jesus. It means you believe the people who we elect to run the government are the ones who actually run the government, not federal bureaucrats who multiply themselves like a national cancer that's now metastasizing to the private sector. It means that the best ideas win instead of getting censored. It means you don't have to choose between speaking your mind freely and putting food on the dinner table. It means you believe these ideals form the backbone of the greatest nation on earth. We believe in American exceptionalism. Jesus Christ, man. Give it a rest. Give it a rest with all the goofy stuff. It's so funny. He, he likes to think of himself as like, I'm this, you know, I'm this amer amazing truth teller. That's what this campaign's about. And then it's like, we believe in American exceptionalism. American exceptionalism. Is that the truth? By the way, what's another word for uh, exceptional? Supreme. So you're an American supremacist. Tell me how the Iraq war squares with American exceptionalism. Illegally and offensively invading a country that didn't attack us and killing minimum hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians. How does Guantanamo Bay square with American exceptionalism? I'd love to hear that. There was an article that just came out the other day. There was a, you know, a an expert detailed all of the kinds of torture that were done. One of them was rectal feeding. Now, the U.S. government claims, well, this is a medical procedure, but medical experts are like, no, it's not. So they basically anally raped people at Guantanamo Bay. That's what they did. They used communist Chinese manuals on how to torture as a roadmap on how to treat the prisoners that we had here. By the way, you know who oversaw that um, torture? Ron DeSantis. American exceptionalism. I can't. These people are so goofy, man. That the rest of the world still looks up to as its example. Not the Soviet Union in the last century, and not communist China in this one either. That is the new American dream. Ask yourself if you still believe in these ideals. I don't care if you're black or white, gay or straight, Democrat or Republican for that matter. Are you on board with these basic principles? If you are, then we're on the same team. I think most of you believe these things to be true. I think most of you think that your neighbors, your colleagues, and your classmates also believe these things to be true, but you can't be sure anymore because you don't feel free to talk about it. Maybe you disagree with each other about whether corporate- I, I hate, like, the on the brave truth teller thing when they, the, he's repeating talking points, regurgitating talking points that are super mainstream. He's acting like, bro, I'm going to tell you this, uh, this hidden truth you never heard before. Ready? Wokeness is bad, bro. <laughs> you hear that 70,000 times a day in every corner of the internet. This isn't some, like, bold new thing you're coming up with. For tax rates should be high or low. Whether ivermectin treats COVID, and that's fine. But those are details. We still agree on the most basic rules of the road. At least most of us do. Yet the goal of the ruling party in this country is to convince us that we are divided. Why? So they can accumulate more power for themselves. Well, you know what? 
I have a dream that we can be one people again. That our best days are actually, truly, not in some cheesy politician kind of way, but actually. Hilarious, because this guy is the quintessential cheesy politician. Ahead of us. We've obsessed so much over our diversity and our differences that we forgot all the ways we're really just the same, bound by a common set of ideals as Americans. I believe deep in my bones that those ideals still exist. And I'm running for president to revive them. E pluribus unum. From many, one. That is the dream that won the American Revolution. That is the dream that reunited us after the Civil War. That is the dream that won us two world wars and the Cold War. That is the dream that still gives hope to the free world. And if we can revive that dream over fractious group identity, then nobody in the world, not a nation, not a corporation, not a virus is going to defeat us. That is what American exceptionalism is all about. And that is what we need to revive in order to save this great nation. Oh my God, he thought he nailed that so hard. That was embarrassing. That was embarrassing. Look, you know what my takeaway is from this? When politicians abandon class analysis, they look like gigantic idiots. I mean, I, there's no other conclusion, right? I mean, when you don't have class analysis at the heart of your politics, you just look like a goofball. You know, ch cherry picking your pet issues, but like, they're not... He makes it seem like he's connected to some greater project. Even if this guy got every single policy he wanted implemented, we'd still have a have income and wealth inequality that's worse than the Gilded Age. We'd still have political corruption everywhere in sight. We'd still have a population that is, you know, yearning for real change to make their lives better. Ah, Jesus, man. Never abandon class analysis. This is what it gets you. Being a cheesy goofball like this guy. All right, so more on this guy. Vivek G. Ramaswamy is an American entrepreneur, author, and conservative political activist. After working as an investment partner, Ramaswamy founded the biopharmaceutical company Roviant Sciences in 2014. Oh, cool. So, so again, all the posturing is like, bro, I'm anti-elitist. Are you really? You, uh, you founded a biopharmaceutical company. Uh, by the way, let's take a minute here to see his anti-elitist credibility, education, Harvard University and Yale University. Very in touch with the common man, if you ask me. He's really, you know, he's got his finger on the pulse of working men and women across this country. Since 2020, he's been writing and speaking out against stakeholder capitalism, big tech censorship, and critical race theory. He left Roviant in 2021, and in August of the same year, published Woke Inc., Inside Corporate America's Social Justice Scam. In 2022, he co-founded Strive Asset Management, an investment firm opposed to environmental, social, and corporate governance. All right, so let me pause here. This is what's called ESG. And this is this guy's big thing, or it's been to this point in his career, where he's on a crusade against ESG. What is ESG? ESG, to sum it up in simple terms, is basically... Uh, the attempt of corporations to virtue signal that they're not terrible. So they say, bro, we have a good ESG score. So that means even though we're ruthless, vicious corporation only cares about our bottom line, uh, we are not terrible for the environment and we're not like terrible to uh, minorities. We're very inclusive and diverse. And there's no like, there's no there there for ESG. The idea is if you have some like some liberal person somewhere with money that they want to invest, the ESG score is a virtue signal that like, hey, if you're a liberal, you can invest in us because we care about the environment. We care about minorities. We're not, you know, we're not total assholes, basically. That's all it is. It's just a total corporate virtue signal. Um, the real criticism of ESG is like the corporations don't actually abide by, you know, what they claim to believe in. They don't actually care about the community or the public or whatever. This is just like a veneer of like, we're not a terrible corporation. We're one of the good corporations. That's a good criticism of ESG. His criticism is like, why are you even pretending that you're not a terrible corporation? Please be ruthless and only care about the bottom line. Like that's his perspective on it. Okay. So, um, is there anything else here that's really worth pointing out? He announced his candidacy in the 2024 Republican party presidential primaries. He considered running, I believe for U S Senate, in Ohio previously. Uh, and then they go on to talk more about his business career, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all right. So now, now let's get to, 
He did an interview with Hannity. Hannity's going to ask him, look to Hannity's credit. That's not something you hear me say often on this show. He's going to ask him the same question he's asked other Republican candidates. Namely, hey man, how are you different from Trump at all, like policy-wise? This is an awesome clip. Enjoy. You're looking for the Republican nomination. Probably the, the leader right now would be Donald Trump if you look at the polls. What are the policy differences you have between yourself and Donald Trump? So, first of all, Donald Trump's a friend. I'm not running against him. I am running on a vision for well, our nation. You're, wait a minute, but you're not running for him. You're running against him. Let's be honest. I'm, okay, well, here's what I'm running for our country. But here's, but let's, be, let's, let's talk about differences, because I'm with you, Sean. He was the OG of America first. I'm taking that to the next level with America first 2.0. Okay, let's actually get the job done, which means dismantling federal bureaucracy. Instead of Instead of actually these managerial protections and civil service protections, I'm proposing eight-year sunset clauses for anybody in the federal bureaucracy. If I can't derive a paycheck from the federal government as the next U.S. president for more than eight years, I don't think other federal bureaucrats should either. I'm Dismantling federal bureaucracy. Sunsetting everybody in government, their like, time in government to eight years max. Imagine thinking that will solve anything at all, that won't solve a single thing. Because at the end of the day, the root cause of all of our problems is money in politics. It is the legalized bribery. It is the corruption. So the system represents only corporations and billionaires and lobbyists and donors. He's not saying address that at all. He's saying, what if we just like limited the amount of time they're in office? Okay, then you would have one person who's corrupt in there for eight years, and they would be replaced by another person who's corrupt in there for eight years. These people are so silly. Like, his solutions are not actual solutions. And that's the first thing you bring up when asked how you're different from Donald Trump. He was the OG. He's America first. I'm America first 2.0. And that's why we're going to dismantle federal bureaucracy. Well, by the way, let me know how that worked out, for example, with the rail industry. Oh, that's right. They did deregulation, they dismantled the federal bureaucracy, and now we have a, a chemical fire that poisoned people in East Palestine, Ohio. Turns out sometimes federal bureaucracy and regulation is massively important. It was also important when um, the government returned $12 billion to defrauded Americans. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau did that, looking out for regular people against corporate behemoths. You want to dismantle that federal bureaucracy? Well, Donald Trump already did. And that's the stuff you argue for, even though that was, we're measurably worse as a result of dismantling that bureaucracy. Unbelievable. I'm going to shut down federal agencies. Earlier today, I put out my proposal to actually shut down the Department of Education, which should not. The second thing he brings up to differentiate himself from Trump is, I want to shut down the uh, Department of Education. Yeah, that's, man. Americans are really yearning for that. There's Americans in the streets every day. They're like, if only you would get rid of the Department of Education, everything would be much better off. Real finger on the pulse stuff you got there going on. Jesus Christ, this guy's terrible. That exist. That's just the first of many government agencies that I am pledging to shut down as the next president. I am dismantling this climate religion. We have been addicted to a climate religion that shackles the United States. Third thing he brings up is that this is just, this is just warmed over climate change denial, right? That's the third thing he brings up. How am I different from Trump? Trump said um, climate change was a Chinese hoax, a Chinese conspiracy. Well, I'll say I'm even more against the science than he is. That's right. What a goofball. Jesus. While leaving China untouched. So I think this is about taking it to the next level as far as I see it. All right, Vivek, we're going to watch your campaign closely. Uh, welcome. Yeah, congrats on uh, the 12 voters that you'll inevitably get. Um, look, he's just trying to make a name for himself. He's not trying to win, trying to, you know, um, launch a, a future career somewhere in politics. I mean, that's what he's trying to do here. I don't think he's actually trying to win, but man, he gets under my skin so much. This guy is beyond annoying. His ideas are horrendous. And I think that's pretty clear. If you want to see me and Crystal Ball interview legends like Noam Chomsky, Cornell West, and more, subscribe to Crystal Kyle and Friends on Substack. $5 a month gets you the video version a day early. Remember, we take zero ad dollars for this podcast. Or you can sign up on Substack for free and get the audio version a day later. Link in the video description box below.